we're going to talk about prayer. And uh, you may have noticed what the choir just sang, the Lord's Prayer. And if you'll remember the series, I've been on prayer a couple of times, and one of the times it was taught this way, and it was Jesus' instruction in what we call the Lord's Prayer. And so today we're just going to simply talk about pray this way. What does it mean to pray, and how do I pray, and, and, and how do I develop a, a habit of prayer? Because here's the deal about prayer. Prayer is a discipline. A discipline. What's a discipline? A discipline is something that we initially must make ourselves do, right? And we get into the habit of it. We discipline ourselves to do that thing, right? So um, what are some of the disciplines you're involved with in life? Any of you runners? Okay, we got, we got a couple runners out there, and you're pretty disciplined. I see some of you out there, you know, every morning, and you're out there doing your thing. Football players, anybody play football? No? no. Okay, we got a football player, and you're disciplined to do football, right? I mean, you're going go to you're gonna go to practice? You're going to crawl the field up and down a few times, the air crawls. You're going to run a few stadiums. And you think, man, why am I doing this? Because I'm disciplined to do it. And in prayer, it's no different. We have to become disciplined in our prayer life in order for our prayer life to, to be a, a successful, to be a challenging, to be a life-changing kind of thing. It's a, it's a discipline of, of coming before the Lord, and it's part of following the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's one thing to read Scripture. You know, I, I pick up the Scripture and I read it, and guess what? Immediately I, I, I gain a knowledge. Immediately I see some wisdom. Immediately it affects me, right? But it's not that way with prayer. Because when it comes to prayer, it may not be exactly immediate that I, that I sense the effect, that, that I understand what's going on. It, it, because prayer has more to do with faith, it seems. As a matter of fact, the writer of the Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1, he said, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Of things hoped for. In other words, those things we don't quite have yet. And it's a conviction of things not seen. So grab a hold of this. When we're praying, we are praying to someone that we have never seen, and we're expecting an answer that we cannot control. Think about that. None of us have seen God. We're praying to someone we've not seen. That is an act of faith. And we're expecting an answer that we have no control over. That's an act of faith. Coming before God in that way and in that manner. And like every other thing that requires faith, prayer, you know, it runs contrary to, to our natural self. Because grab a hold of this. You know, if I got a problem, I'm going to correct that problem. Right? Isn't that the way you do? How many of you are golfers? Or do you think you're golfers? You know, on the level of Jordan Spieth. Well, I just found out something this morning. I was back in the coffee shop. One of our men's a golfer. He said uh, he, he got a 54-degree wedge. And that wedge had been uh, filed out in its um, doohickeys and its, its face. It's what? Grooves, thank you. You know, sometimes doohickey has to work. <laughs> I've been hanging around Wade from Arkansas. Uh, and said, man, when he hits with that ball, hits, hits with that wedge, those grooves um, filed out, that ball just stops, and he's not doing anything different. My question was, was well, that legal on the tour? And they said, I doubt it. But somebody came back and said, well, you can order that kind of wedge. I don't know. Whatever. Where was I going with that? I was going. Man, I hate it when that happens. <laughs> Makes me feel like an old folk. Correcting the problems, you know. 
They said, I, I, I was getting it. So I, I'm correcting these problems, and I, I'm going along, and, and, and you know, it, uh, I can kind of do this. So prayer runs contrary to that because I'm talking to someone I've not seen, and I'm expecting an answer that I can't control, and I'm asking God to do something in my life instead of me trying to, to do it all myself. F.B. Meyer said, the great tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer. That's not life's great tragedy. The great tragedy of life is an unoffered prayer. Do you realize that we could do most things that we do in your typical church and never come before God in prayer and still have measures of success? Did you know that? Because we put so much of our human effort into so many of the things we do. But God says, you know, come to me. He says, bring your prayer before me. Let me fill your prayer with my power. Let me fill your life with my Holy Spirit. Let me empower you to become all that I've designed you to become and to be. And you see something completely different. Charles Spurgeon, he was the greatest preacher of the Victorian era. And this is what he said. He said, if the spirit of prayer is not with the people, the minister may preach like an angel, but cannot expect success. He said, there may be in the church wealth, talent, labor, and many outreach efforts, but the Lord is not there. Prayer is the sure evidence of the promise of the presence of God as the rising of the thermometer is evidence of an increasing temperature. If God is near a church, it must pray. If he is not, one of the obvious signs of his absence will be a lethargy of prayer. So Spurgeon is saying prayer is important. And, and you know, to be honest, you know, we have to admit that for the most part in our prayer lives, you know, it's an undisciplined area of our life. Oh, yeah, we, it's not that we don't pray. It's just that we don't get into it. Oh, we pray. We come together. We have a Bible study, and we begin with prayer. Oh, Lord, thank you for this time to come together. We ask you to bless this time. You know, and we just, we're, we're barely skimming the surface. Or it's time to eat. We'll have a blessing. Some of you are still praying, God is good, God is great. Let us thank Him for our food. And there's nothing wrong with that prayer and teaching it to your children. But as a growing Christian, you need to get deeper. So it's an undisciplined area of our life. Because, you know, if we're praying on a superficial level, we never get to the depths. And we get a little deeper and... and, and uh, and, and then, you know, we can even get into to praying in the Spirit uh, as the Bible directs us. But prayer is that untapped resource. Prayer is that unexplored continent. I don't know who wrote this. I found it somewhere. And, and so I said, man, that sounds good. It's where countless treasure remains to be unearthed. In other words, as we learn to pray, there's treasures that we unearth in our lives, that we unearth in the kingdom of God, that the God brings alive in us and, and, and awakens us to. A number of years ago, when we still were in the little building uh, down where the youth built meet today, we had a, a prayer conference, and, and we had a fellow, he was old as dirt back then. His name was Don Miller. Y'all remember Don Miller, those of you that were here at that time? And Don, at the time, I think he was up in his upper, mid to upper 80s, somewhere in there. Now, I'm not saying if you're in your mid to upper 80s, you know, I'm not calling you old. But you're older than me. And, um, and I remember I was standing around with a couple of, uh, of our deacons uh, at that time. And, you know, we were all still kind of young and all. And one of them said, What's this old man going to teach us about prayer? And I said, I don't know, but this other pastor told me he was really good. And that Don Miller, he taught us about prayer. He taught us that prayer is much more than saying God is good and God is great. Let us thank him for our food. He taught us that prayer is walking in the company 
of God. It's about being a friend of God, about being a child of God, about talking to God over and over and over again. And so when the Apostle Paul writes to the Colossians, he writes to them about prayer. Now, when he writes to them about prayer, uh, our, our text this morning is Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. But, you know, that's not the first time he's talked to them about prayer. You see, where God, where, where Paul first speaks of prayer is in chapter 1. In verse number 3, he says, We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. So Paul's saying, you know, I'm a man, and I'm with other men, and I'm with other women, and we pray for you. We pray for you. Do you realize at times that there are people that are praying for you that you don't even know are praying for you? And so Paul said, we pray for you. Now, when we get to chapter 4, verse 2, this is what we read. He says, you know, uh, as he's given all this instruction, he says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And at the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on the account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And so this is what we gather out of Paul. Paul understood the power of prayer. He understood the power of prayer, the power of getting near God, the power of, of listening to the heart of God. You know, prayer is not always our talking. Prayer is sometimes our just sitting still and being quiet and hearing God's heart as He speaks to us. Now, my son Chris speak, uh, uh, preached on the heart of God towards us last Sunday. And God's heart is for you. God's heart throbs for you. God's heart desires you. And as we come to walk with God in prayer, this is what we begin to learn. In that throbbing heart of God, He's got a lot of things He wants to tell us. He's got a lot of things He wants to show us. He's got many ways in which He wants to bless us as we come near to Him in prayer. And, and, and what we find as Paul writes and throughout the Scriptures is that we, as the people of God, are called over and over and over and over again to be a people of prayer. Now, what is prayer? You know, there was a lot of stuff in the news about the Canadian oil pipeline. Remember, you know, six months ago? And what does that pipeline do? What does the Alaskan pipeline do? What does the Mexican pipeline do? What does it do? Come on, somebody, help me. I mean, we've only got 14 minutes if you want out of here on time. Okay, there you, you want out of here? No, you don't. This is going to be so good. But that pipeline, it furnishes oil, right? It furnishes oil. Now listen to, to, to this quote, and it's another quote I found somewhere. It's not my own. Prayer is a pipeline of communication between God and His people. Between God and those who love Him. And the growing disciple will be the one who is in the habit or the discipline of praying. So how should you pray? You know, preacher, you're telling me I, I need to get over that God is good, God is great prayer, and move on to something a little bit deeper. How should you pray? Well, number one, you've got to pray with persistence. Listen to what Paul said in that second verse. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Now, in the original Greek language, that continue steadfastly is a single word, and it means to persist in. It means to adhere firmly to. It means to be re uh, devoted to, uh, to give an unremitting care to. Persistence. Persistence. Don't drop your guard on persistence. Now, do you know what persistence is? Persistence is almost nagging in a sense. You know, just keep picking at it. 
Friday, I had the joy of driving my youngest daughter to Jacksonville to attend a college ID camp uh, at the University of North Florida. And I want you to know, how many of y'all know my daughter, Elena? How many of you think she's sweet? She is a terrorist. (laughs) She persistently picked at me going down the road. I'm driving along, and all of a sudden, whap! I'm driving along, and she starts throwing her crumbs at me. I mean, just persistent. And wouldn't stop. We're not talking about me. I did get it stopped when I picked up a potato chip crumb yesterday on the way back and crumbled it up and held it over her head and dropped it. She calmed down after that. But it's persistence. Relentless. When she's on the soccer field, she's persistent and relentless, going after the ball, going for the goal, you know, going to make the play, right? And and that's what that persistence in prayer is about. You know, it's coming before God over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote to the the Thessalonians and said, pray without without ceasing. To pray without ceasing, for this is God's will concerning you. How do I pray without ceasing? It means that I'm walking around in a spirit of prayer. It means that I'm living my life out in prayer. I may not be formally on my knees at every moment in my life, but in prayer, I'm going forward. In prayer, I'm going here and I'm going there. In prayer, I'm I'm allowing the Lord to impress upon me the directions and, and the advantages of His plan and His purpose in my life. In the, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus said, And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. In other words, this is what Jesus is saying. He says, pray and don't give up. Now here's where we falter. We, we have this tendency to pray and give up. You say, well, wait, what, what do you mean? Well, I prayed about this five minutes ago and I don't have an answer yet. I'll just move on. How many of us are guilty? I mean, you don't have to raise your hand. I mean, I understand. We, we have that tendency to just go on. But Jesus says, keep praying. Keep on praying no matter what. Don't give up no matter what. You keep praying. You see, there's no such thing as an unanswered prayer. I know the country song says, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. It's a good song, but it's bad theology. God answers our prayer. Yes, no, or wait. He's always going to give you answer. So Jesus says, pray and don't give up. In other words, keep on asking. In other words, keep on seeking. Keep on knocking until God has given you an uh, an answer. Persistence is not giving up. And, 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 you know, we, don't, we are not to give up on prayer. You know, sometimes we, we give up because we're not feeling it. But we're not to live our life by feeling. We're not to live our lives by feeling, but to live our lives by the commandments of the Lord who tells us to pray without ceasing. So we're to pray with persistence. Okay? Number two, we are to pray with passion. Continue steadfastly. In prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. You know, to be watchful means to be diligent. It means to be vigilant. It's to have passion. What do you you have passion for in your life? What's your passion? I heard the newscaster last night saying college football is still months away, and I thought, wait a minute, dude. College football is just uh, about five weeks away. And I know, you know, that we've got some people in this room that are passionate about college football, right? I mean, you know, people get, get fired up about it. They're, they're at least down here in the South, you know, they love college football. And um, I saw a friend of mine put on Facebook. He said his daughter asked him, did he really think that FSU could beat Alabama in football? And his reply was, 
Honey, I love you, but I'm going to miss you. <laughs> people get excited. They get passionate about it. Some people are passionate about shopping. Any of you guys have a wife who's passionate about shopping? Don't, worry, don't raise your hand. Be careful. Some of you are passionate about hunting. Some are passionate about golf, and it doesn't show. Why? You know, we get passionate. But in our prayer, we are to be passionate. We're to be vigilant. We're to be watchful. We're to have a passion in our prayer life that comes before God. S.D. Gordon, in his book, called Quiet Talks on Prayer, said, How much prayer meant to Jesus? When perplexed, He prayed. When hard-pressed by work, He prayed. When hungry for fellowship, He was in prayer. He chose His associates and received His messages upon His knees. If tempted, He prayed. If criticized, He prayed. If fatigued in body or weird in spirit, He had recourse to His one unfailing habit of prayer. Prayer brought him unmeasured power at the beginning and kept the flow unbroken and undiminished. There is no emergency, no difficulty, no necessity, no temptation that would not yield to prayer. In this series, we're talking about following Jesus. And if we're going to follow Jesus and we're not going to know the kind of victory that Jesus knew, we have got to pray as the Lord teaches us to pray. Think about what that passionate prayer does. Passionate prayer opens heaven. The Bible tells us, Luke 3.21. Now, I told you a minute ago that we read Scripture and we gain knowledge, right? Do you remember me telling you that? Come on, help me. We've got five minutes. Okay, so I told you that. Now, Jesus was baptized and heaven opened. And the Holy Spirit descended. How many of you read that passage before? Come on, help out. Okay? Have you ever caught this part in the passage? That he was baptized and he prayed and heaven was open? How many of you have ever caught that and he prayed and heaven was open? I just, I just found that a couple weeks ago. I've been reading the Bible for a long time, and it finally, it, it jumped out at me. He, he was baptized, and heaven was open. In other words, he was taking a step of obedience, and he prayed, and heaven was open. And when we walk in obedience and we walk in prayer, God opens heaven in our hearts and in our lives. That's what Malachi talked about when God said, test me and try me in this. In obedience, you know, we bring our tithe to the full house, to the storehouse and see if the window of heaven is not open in our lives. You know, obedience and, bre- and prayer go together with blessing. And passionate prayer shines God's light of direction on our path. You know, before Jesus called his disciples, the Bible says he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. Knowing the right people to bring around, being the right people to, do, to have around, to, to, to be his closest associates. There'd be 12 of those men, and three would be in that inner circle. And he prayed. He had to have that direction, he had to have that light shine. And, and it's, a, it's a passionate prayer that ushers us into the throne room of heaven and enables us to experience the glory of the Father. Think about Jesus at his transfiguration. In his transfiguration, the Bible says, and as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. Can I tell you something? When you have been passionate in your prayer, heaven is not the only place that knows it. You can spot people of prayer. You can tell a person of prayer by their countenance, by their words. Passionate prayer expresses our deepest desires and reveals our love for others. In John 17, Jesus is praying for those who would follow after him. Not just those those 12 men. He was praying for you and he was praying for me. 
Passionate prayer enables us to totally be honest with God, even in the midst of the most trying circumstances. Jesus is praying through the night in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible says, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And can I tell you that in those moments of agony, in those times of of, of desperation, we tend to be more earnest, we tend to be more passionate than we have ever been at any other time in our lives. And most every one of you have walked through a valley of desperation. And if you've never walked through a valley of desperation, it's only a matter of time until you do. But desperation will come, and if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you'll find that you will pray passionately in that time. A number of years ago, I was getting ready to go on my very first mission trip, 1995. Um, we'd been here for three years. Our house in Georgia had not sold. The banker uh, who had been my friend for all those years, um, you know, my, my home was financed on what we called an evergreen note, and every six months I went in and signed a renewal. And he told me, he said, uh, Steve, he said, uh, the board told me I can't do this anymore. You got to, you know, be able to come up with all the money or get the house sold or whatever by the next renewal date or they're going to take it. Man, I prayed and prayed, and I couldn't find any answer. I prayed and prayed and prayed, and still wasn't getting an answer. But remember, Jesus said, pray and don't give up. Seek, knock. It's going to be open to you. And ask. Pray and don't give up. And so, nothing happened, and I was leaving for Indonesia the next morning. And the closing date was two days after I'd leave, I would leave for Indonesia. And that night, I finally, after I'd been up countless nights wrestling with God about this, I finally said, okay, God, I give up. You've got a plan. And whatever it is, I just surrender to it. Next morning, a friend of mine called and said, hey, uh, Pastor, he said, I know the struggle you've had with that. Um, if you'll sign this, um, my company, we're going to buy that note, and we're going to hold that note, and you know we'll charge you interest and everything, but until you can get the place sold. And he said he, uh, he sent his attorneys up there, and they took care of it you know, with the bank that day. He said, I should have seen the look on their faces. Because I said, you know, the bank board, uh, there was a board member that wanted my piece of property. <laughs> And that's why it wasn't getting renewed. You know how things happen in small towns. But I was desperate. And it's not the only time I've ever been desperate in my life. I mean, there have been many desperate times, but it's in that earnestness of desperation that you will see the mighty hand of God become so real in your life. That is almost unfathomable. Because passionate prayer is the portal to God's power. Passionate prayer is prayer from the heart. Number three, since y'all have caused me to go over time by two minutes. Pray with a grateful heart. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer with thanksgiving. The attitude of gratitude, that simply means, God, I'm going to thank you. You know, this is a pretty amazing thing. Did anybody bother to stop and say, God, thank you for this house of worship today where the seats are cushioned and the air conditioning's on and the choir sounds great? Did any, I mean, did anybody stop to do that? I mean, we become familiar with stuff, don't we? I mean, anybody notice that there's a screen missing this morning? That's Pastor Matt's fault. (laughs) No, not really. We'll blame it on Kevin. No, it's not his fault either. The projector went out and had to be sent back to the projector people. But we become familiar with it, and we don't miss it until it's not there, Right? And, and we become familiar with the things that God has provided in our lives, and we don't miss them till they're not there. 
You know, last Sunday morning, those of us in the, in the Dominican Republic, we worshipped on a patio, so to speak, under, you know, a roof patio. It was kind of shady. There were shade trees around it. The view was tremendous. You know, looking out, you could see the Atlantic Ocean out there in front of you. The balmy, hot, humid breeze was blowing. And you were breaking out in a sweat. Anybody on the DR, anybody, any of y'all say, God, thank you for air conditioning this morning? And mean it? Gratitude. We've all had a meal this weekend, right? Last week, our team went on one of the days of the ministry down there feeds people that work in the dump in the uh, waste management industry. And their job in the waste management industry is as these, dumped, as these garbage trucks pull in, they jump on them. You know what they're doing? They're getting the leftover hotel food to eat themselves and to feed their family. They're getting plastic. It's nasty and it's filthy. But do we remember to truly thank God for the beautiful plates that are set in front of us? The attitude of gratitude. I mean, how many of you are mamas? How many of you mamas wash and fold clothes? And how many of you mamas have your family say, I am so grateful? Oh, come on, y'all don't laugh. Surely somebody says thank you. Go home and tell your mama thank you. You see, it's an attitude of gratitude. And as we come before God, here's the deal. We're to be grateful. God, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you've done and all that you provide in my life. So we pray with persistence. We pray with passion. We pray with a grateful heart. And we pray selfishly. He says in verse 3, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us uh, for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. You know, Paul, Paul is praying for others, and, and he's asking others to, come, to pray for him, and this thing of praying for others is called intercessory prayer. He's not saying, pray that I'll get out of jail. He's not saying, pray that I'll have an easy time. He says, pray that there will be the doors of opportunity open for me to present the mystery of Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ, in His life, expresses intercessory prayer for us. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah 53, 400 years before Christ came to earth, Isaiah said, He bore the sin of many, we recognize that, and makes intercession for transgressors. Jesus prays for us. He prays for us. He's making intercession for us. Jesus said, as he spoke in the Garden of Gethsemane, I have prayed for you, specifically to Peter, that your faith shall not fail. He prayed for us on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He prayed for us that after the cross that we would have another comforter. In John, 17, uh, John 14, another helper, the Holy Spirit, the divine paraclete who would come and wrap us and hold us and empower us and protect us and produce in us the spirit of godliness that honors and glorifies Him. Paul wrote to the Romans and said, Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God right now, who indeed is interceding for us. Wow. That's a wow moment. Jesus is there interceding for us. And in Hebrews it says, Consequently, He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for us. Paul wanted the Colossian Christians to understand this. The necessity of prayer. And to pray on a specific purpose. What's the specific purpose that you need prayed for? I had someone this week say, Pastor, pray for my child. 
Actually, I get that quite often. Pray for my child specifically. My child's back at this place or in this place. Pray for my child. Somebody else, pray for my child's health. They're not doing well. Pray for my mother. She was just diagnosed with cancer. Pray. To pray on behalf of another. We had another little small victory in our family this past week. My son, Zach, uh, got a degree from Troy University in uh, surveying and geomatic sciences or engineering. And so, uh, you know, he got out of school and immediately had a job and been studying for the last three or four months for this national certification exam, which only 52% of people ever pass the first time through. And we prayed for him specifically, not demanding that God, you know, do anything, but God, you know, you, you've, you've seen him, you've seen him study, you've watched him be diligent. God, would you honor him and bring all the memories back that he needs in taking this exam? I mean, he carried three calculators with 272 equations in them, you know, to all that kind of stuff. And uh, he called to say, I passed. You know, that's pretty cool. I'm proud of him. But, you know, you can pray for your kid like that. Now, Kaleo, all Kaleo over here, right? What are you going to take back with you? Kaleo are college students that are in here from Arkansas and from Oklahoma. They come every summer. and They work in our local economy. They attend local churches all over. And, uh, and they're trained in their, in their Christianity. Okay? So as you go back to school, I am praying right now that God will bless you with the tenacity and that God will bless you to walk forward and to go forward and to carry your faith back on campus in a mighty and an awesome and strong way. And there will be other people in this congregation that will be praying for you guys. They may not know you. They may not know your face. But they'll pray for you. For our student ministry from Temple Baptist in Arkansas, along with our student ministry called... um, Mission Destin this week, we're praying for y'all that God will open doors of opportunity as you serve Him in this place. Because Destin's not like Arkansas. There's a lot of people from all over the world that are here. And so we learn to pray specifically. Pray with persistence. Pray with passion, pray with thanksgiving, and pray with specifics. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, here we stand again at a time of decision. But Lord, it's in persistence that we stand here week after week and pray prayer week after week. And Father, this morning it's with passion that we would come before you and ask you to work in our hearts and our lives. And Lord, the biggest thing I want to ask you to challenge us to is that we, as your people, will truly become a people of passionate prayer. And then Father, that you'd move in this congregation to grow it, to mature it, to help it to be all that you've called it to be. For it's in Christ Jesus we pray. Amen.